Good morning. Welcome to College Heights Baptist Church. I'm so glad that we could be together again. Um, I want to start out by telling you about a really great service opportunity we have coming up where we can be outside together and um, see each other safely but also serve our community. Um, some of you have, may have participated in the past but we are going to um, join our city in the community cleanup again this year. Um, we are going to do that on Sunday, April 25th at one o'clock in the afternoon. We're gonna meet in the parking lot and um, Randy Seabrook will give us our instructions of what area we're supposed to clean, give us garbage bags and gloves. Um, if you have one of these great garbage grabbers, please bring it with you, they're handy. Um, and then we'll set out from there to clean up the area that we have been designated. If you would like to join us, could you please go to our website and register, just like you've done for other events, and that will help us know how many people um, we'll be uh, working together with so that we don't promise to do an area that is too big for us to, to handle. Um, so I look forward to that. And if you are kind of snoopy and... Um, curious like I am about the renos downstairs, keep checking our website. We're trying to update uh, with pictures regularly so you can kind of follow the progress that's going on down there. It's, it's exciting. And now as we head into our time of worship, we're going to go to uh, the Harris girls who are going to lead us in our call to worship this morning. Hi, I'm Britta. And I'm Ainsley. And today we're reading call to worship from Psalm 67. May God be merciful and bless us. May his face smile with favor on us. May your ways be known throughout the earth, your saving power among people everywhere. May the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Let the whole world sing for joy because you govern the nations with justice and guide the people of the whole world. May all the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Have, Have a good Sunday, everyone. Thank you, girls. Let's sing. Jesus, hope of the nations. Jesus, comfort for all who mourn. You are the source of heaven's hope. Light in the darkness, Jesus, truth in each circumstance. You are the source of heaven's light on earth. In history, you lived and died. You broke the chains, you rose to life. You are the Living for all. 
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing a song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be sick when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never Carl. It's a great song to lead us into our prayer time. Uh, we had an exciting week here uh, this week. Uh, we had our first Alpha Online session, and we had uh, around 20 people uh, that were either not Christian or they were new Christians uh, that joined us for that. So uh, that's really exciting. Uh, it's not too late to join if, if that's something that uh, if you are either not a Christian or a new Christian and you'd like to join us for Alpha, you can check it out on our website, find out what it's all about. There's uh, video sessions and, and conversation that take place. It's been really good uh, on our first session. Um, maybe you know somebody that might be interested. You can direct them uh, my way. You can get them to email me or give me a phone call. That's todd at mychbc.ca. Uh, the biggest thing that we could ask for, for uh, from all of you, though, is prayer. So it's on Wednesday nights. It's happening uh, at 7.30. So if you think of us, or maybe you can mark it on your calendar, would you just uh, spend some time praying for us and for all the different people that are helping out with that ministry? That would be so much appreciated. Um, also, uh, on the uh, subject of prayer, we have a weekly prayer meeting. I know that uh, we have announced it uh, a couple of times before, but just in case you're unaware, maybe you forgot, we have a weekly prayer meeting that happens over Zoom on Tuesday mornings at 10.30. Um, and it's uh, been, uh, that's been really good. I've been really enjoying that. Um, my question is, I wonder if there's a, a time that might be better for some of you. 
a different day, a different time. Uh, I just want to know if there's other people who would like to join us, but just can't make the Tuesday at 10.30. So uh, we're potentially willing to move that. If, if we could uh, do that to accommodate some more people, that would be great. Uh, we know that we're not the only people in our church praying, but it's always great to add uh, people to our number there. So uh, reach out to me again for that, if you would. Um, today, Curtis is going to be speaking uh, to us from Psalm 57, which is a, a, a psalm that he wrote while he was in a cave. Um, and I just thought what we would do today is uh, look at another psalm um, uh, that David wrote from a cave uh, as we go to prayer, and, and maybe we could pray that as a church together. And so we're just going to look at Psalm 142, and if, uh, so if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up to Psalm 142 and just follow along with me as we pray together. Uh, I'll give you an opportunity to bring your own prayer requests uh, up as we do that. So let's just bow and, and go to the Lord. God, we are so thankful for you, and we cry aloud to you, God. We lift our voice up to you uh, for mercy. We're all people who need your mercy, God. That doesn't exclude anybody. We're all in, in desperate need there. And we also are people who, who have troubles, and, and so we bring those uh, struggles and, and troubles to you, God. And I thank you that, that we can bring those things and, and bring them to your ears and that you hear our, our, our prayers, God. Um, there's lots of things going on in our, each one of our lives that are not going according to our own plans, God. Um, you know of those things, but you also invite us to speak to you about those. So uh, just in, in these uh, moments that follow, I'll just leave some silence for each of us to uh, bring those things to you, God. Uh, our troubles. Would you just hear us now as we pray for those things? And Lord, we want to lift up other people in our lives as well uh, that we're concerned about, that, that are on our hearts and are on our minds, that we know of, that are going through struggles and, and times of uh, difficulty right now. We want to lift them up to you as well. And God, our our spirits, they grow faint within us. We experience that uh, very easily in this life. And we know that, uh, that you're the one who watches over our, our ways. We, we are thankful for that, God. Uh, in our path, we have all sorts of danger. Each day, uh, God, we face all sorts of different uh, struggles and troubles and dangers. And we just ask, Lord, that you would, uh, just in your faithfulness, watch over us. Walk with us through those struggles. And God, at, at times, uh, it can feel like um, that there's no one concerned about us and that we have no refuge and, and that no one cares for us. It can be a lonely place, especially as we uh, walk through this uh, situation in our current world with this pandemic that that is keeping us far more separated than we would normally be. I just ask God that you would meet us in that place, that you would uh, find us when we feel alone, when we feel hopeless, and that you would uh, comfort us, God, because we know that even though uh, we may feel those things. We know that there are people who care, and, and we even greater than that, we have a God who just cares so desperately about us. We cry out to you. We say that you alone are our refuge, our portion in the land of the living. And, and God, in a world that we are, are so tempted to put our 
uh, find or to find our security in other things like uh, more money or more possessions or the right relationship. Um, God, just remind us that we can only find our refuge in you, that you're the only one who can provide that security and, and that you alone are our portion. God, would you uh, reach out to us in our times of need? Would you help us uh, and, and set us free from, from the situations that we face day to day? And God, we are in a situation in our lives right now where we're, we just can't meet like we normally would and gather. And uh, yet we do look forward to that again. And God, help us to uh, continue to have hope in that. And help us to, to have uh, your praise on our lips at all times, God. Would you uh, help us to um, just be meditating on your word finding you to be praiseworthy, and that when we can get back together again, that that would just be such a natural response of your people to, to gather and to praise you, Lord. We thank you so much for uh, your goodness to each one of us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Hi, everyone, and thank you, Carl, for that song. Uh, if you're not aware, Carl wrote that song based on Psalm 56, so there's some homework for you. Read Psalm 56, and uh, you'll notice that same heart uh, is there in that song. Uh, last week, we wrapped up a sermon series that we were in in the Apostles' Creed, and we did so by thinking about the life everlasting of a day when the kingdom of God will be fully established We'll be in new bodies and a new heaven and a new earth all together with God, the way we were intended to be from the beginning. Uh, a day when everything's going to be made new and we'll have no more distance between God and ourselves. We'll have no more distance between one and another. Uh, no more tears, death, mourning, pain. No fear, no danger. Never again will you be anxious or worry. No war, no sickness. Temptation, sin, evil, curse. The one who's seated on the throne says, the old order, all those things will pass away. They are not going to be a part of our future in the life everlasting. And while that picture of our future is really helpful in focusing us today, prioritizing us, encouraging us, um, the reality is that in the present moment, so many of our days are are lived under the heaviness of our current reality. Uh, a broken world and a broken people living within it. I don't know about you, but I felt that uh, nearer or heavier uh, lately. Brokenness, frustration with the way things are. Uh, I'm really wanting to live well by faith, but I'm starting to realize just how much the grind of this year has um, been for me. Kind of worn. I have a lot of concern for how people I love are holding up, including my own family. Uh, I find my, myself missing my old rhythms. find myself missing all of you. Um, I'm realizing this is a season for patience and for perseverance. And I don't do either of those two things very well. And so, as is often in, in my life the case, I find myself drawn to the Psalms of David, especially the ones that are birthed in a place of turmoil or brokenness, because uh, I find that when I jump in there, when I'm in a place um, where, where it feels like there's distress and it's hard to pray, I just find I can go to these Psalms and they become the prayer that I'm struggling to find myself um, they meet me in the emotional state that I'm at and give me permission to feel what I'm feeling, but it also directs me towards a healthier mindset and inspires trust and confidence that God will lead me through. And so what I want to do today is, um, with you, do the very thing I'm doing on my own, which is turning to the Psalms and doing a bit of a soul check in a season that is grinding me down a bit here. And so in complete contrast to the theme last week, the life everlasting to come, uh, we're going to look at what is often a present reality. And it's a different picture. It's a picture of a cave. Uh, the cave is a metaphor for tears, for trial, for fear, the threat of danger, even death. Okay, the old order that one day will pass away, but right now is our lot. Uh, the cave is a place of loneliness and isolation. Uh, where the painful consequences of our sinful and broken world are ever near. The cave's an inescapable human experience. Each of us will visit it at some point and likely many times in our life. And sometimes it'll be because of our own sin that got us there. Sometimes it'll be that it's the sin of others that have uh, kind of made a mess of our life. And then sometimes it's just simply... Life in this world is broken people. But the cave can be a place also where great transformation can happen. Uh, we can go into the cave almost like a caterpillar into the cocoon. 
and come out uh, different than we entered, beautiful, ready to fly and soar like a butterfly. What I mean by that is when I look back on my own life, it's typically been in the cave uh, that I've grown the most into the man that God wants me to be, uh, though there's still such a, a long way for me to go. Though I wouldn't want to revisit any of my cave experiences, even for a moment, what I know is that I wouldn't be who I am today apart from them. I wouldn't know God the way that I do now. I wouldn't know myself the way that I do now. And I'm very sure I wouldn't be able to come alongside and support and encourage others the way I can now, if not for those experiences. And even now, on the other side of the cave, or having left those cave experiences, I know I'm able to look back and see that God's redeemed them. Uh, He's brought beauty out of ashes, hope out of grief, light from darkness and birth new purpose and shape new character within me, out of my pain. This is who he is. This is what he does. He redeems. And we're certainly going to see that in the psalm set before us. So I invite you at this point to open your Bibles. We're going to be in Psalm 57, a song we've looked at before, and Lord willing, we'll look at again Uh, You probably caught on by now. I'm not the kind of guy that thinks you only have to look at a piece of Scripture once in your life and you've got it. Uh, I love to circle back again and again to see um, fresh insights and discover the way Scriptures we might even be familiar with meet us in new seasons. So as you're opening, Psalm 57, how about I say a prayer for us and then we'll dive in. God, thank you for this song that we can look at. Thank you for the life of David, which is recorded in the scriptures that you've preserved through thousands of years for us to open today. And we pray that you would, um, by the Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our heart to be able to see what you want to show us therein. Uh, Encourage us, convict us, inspire us, strengthen us, Give patience and perseverance, and I pray especially for those who may be in the cave, so to speak, today, even as they hear this message, that you would especially bring comfort and hope to each one. Uh, We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so Psalm 57, I hope you have it open in front of you. Uh, You'll see it's 11 verses long. You'll see it's a simple structure. Uh, There's a repeated chorus in verse 5 and 11, with a verse in between. So it goes verse 1, chorus, verse 2, same chorus. Almost like some of the songs we sing today. Uh, You're going to notice there's a heading at the top, and before we get into the song itself, I want to pause at the heading to point out something super important. And it's this. This is one of those very rare psalms where we actually get to know the circumstances that birthed it. The who, what, when, where, why of the psalmist's life. And the heading tells us this psalm was written by David on the occasion that he fled from Saul into the cave. Uh, And initially I was tempted just to get to the psalm here, but knowing there's so many of you watching online that that, uh, are new to the Christian faith and might not even know who David is, I'm going to take a deep breath, invite you to join me, and let's think together about David's story so we're all caught up. And that story then can be a backdrop against which we hear David's song. Maybe you're wondering, why was David in a cave? And we've got to go way back into the Old Testaments. Uh, the Lord had appointed Saul to be the first king of Israel, but then rejected Saul because of his disobedience. And so he sent the prophet Samuel to anoint one of the sons of Jesse in Bethlehem to be the next king. This is a big deal. And so Jesse parades his sons in front of the prophet Samuel, seven brothers, each impressive in stature in strength and looks. But God tells Samuel, none of these are my king. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks in the heart. And so what they end up doing is summoning for David, the youngest, the runt, who's off tending sheep in the fields and the mountains nearby, and apparently not even... Important enough to be there for this occasion? 
Samuel anoints David to be the future king. The Spirit of God comes upon him to empower and lead. But meanwhile, Saul is still king and he's not doing well at all. He's tormented in spirit. He's completely without rest and peace. And so a plan is uh, made to have someone come and play the harp for Saul. So it'd soothe him, it'd settle him down. And somehow David is the one they recommend. Not sure how word made it to the palace, but the king's servants go and fetch David and the plan works. Saul feels relief when David plays his harp and sings for him. And around this same time, Saul and the army of Israel are at war with the mighty Philistine army, which probably explains why Saul is so unsettled and in all sorts of distress. Very specifically, his distress is that the Philistines have put forth a challenge The thinking is this, why should so many men die? Let's settle it this way. You send your finest warrior and we'll send ours. The two of them will battle it out. The losing nation will become subject to the victor. And it was easy for the Philistines to suggest this because they had this incredible warrior named Goliath. A giant of a man, nine feet tall. No Israelite had the courage to face him because it was certain death. And so 40 days pass with this invitation hanging over the battlefield. Each day Goliath would come out, face down the Israelite army and taunt them. And even mock and ridicule the Lord their God. Saul tried to entice his soldiers. He said, look, whoever faces and defeats Goliath is going to have great wealth gets my daughter in marriage, okay? You're going to marry into royalty. Your family will be exempt from taxes. What more could he offer? He's literally offering a piece of the kingdom. Yet nobody took the challenge. Until after 40 days, the young shepherd David arrived at the battlefield with food for his brothers who were in the army. And he listens, he observes He sees this giant of a man ridiculing not just the army of Israel, but ridiculing God. And he says over top of this scene, let no one lose account because of this guy. I'll face him. And so, armed with the slingshot, he used so skillfully as a young shepherd, David met Goliath in battle. And here's what he said on that battlefield that day. He said, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, who you've defied, you've ridiculed, you've mocked. I'm going to strike you down. I'm going to cut off your head. And the world will know there's a God in Israel. David does exactly that. Takes Goliath's head. Israel's victorious. And from that day on, Saul keeps David near him. Uh, David marries the king's daughter. Saul gives David a high rank in the army. David leads the, the, the army of Israel to all sorts of incredible victories. And all of this, though, became a problem because Saul was intensely jealous. He was fearful that he'd lose his throne He heard the people singing songs like this one. Saul's killed his thousands, but David's killed his tens of thousands. It was so bad, actually, that on two occasions, while David was playing the harp, Saul threw a spear, attempting to kill him. And all of this culminated then when Saul had enough and the chase was on. David had to literally flee Jerusalem for his life. But for Saul, it wasn't enough that he left the city. Saul wanted him dead. So what the king did was gathered an elite team of 3,000 soldiers. And these are his finest and his fiercest warriors. Handpicked for this occasion. And he chased David like a wild animal through the wilderness. So bad that for David at one point, he actually had to go and hide among his enemies, the Philistines. He even went to a city named Gath, which was the hometown of the legendary Goliath whom he had killed earlier. He literally strolled into Gath with Goliath's sword. 
realized it was a bad idea, pretended to be insane, raved and ranted like a madman, drool running down his beard, so they sent him off. You actually find that story in Psalm 56, which is what Carl's song he just sang uh, is based on. The fear David had in those moments in Gath, wondering if his life was going to be preserved. And so after that, and we're coming now to Psalm 57, he made his way to the one place he knew he was safe, the mountains, the wilderness where he had spent so much time as a young shepherd in nearby Bethlehem. And that's where we meet David today, in the mountains, specifically in the cave of Adullam. And the backstory for this is 1 Samuel 22. Uh, perhaps even 1 Samuel 24. But David was alone there at the cave, or at least at the beginning, but it was a turning point in his life. While he was at Adullam, eventually his brothers and his father's household came, and all who were in distress or debt or discontented with the reign of Saul, they began to come to him and gather around him, So much so that in total it says 400 men came to him. These guys became his trusted friends, his closest advisors. He became their beloved leader and eventually their king. Which brings us to Psalm 57 in the heading. When he had fled from Saul into the cave. Verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me, for in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster had passed. Pause just quickly. Uh, In our world today, I I point this out often when we're in the Psalms, but when we want to emphasize something, we bold, italicize, we highlight. Especially in, in the Old Testament, how they would draw attention to something is, is to repeat it. If you look down in those first two verses I just read, you'll see there's two words repeated. Mercy. Mercy. Refuge. Refuge. David's body is in a cave. But his soul is still looking for a safe place. In the one who we know as the rock of ages. Verse 2, David says, I cry out to God most high. To God who fulfills his purposes for me. He sends from heaven and saves. Rebuking those who hotly pursue me. Selah. So there's this pause in the song where we can all think about what's come before and out of the pause he says God sends his love and his faithfulness I'm in the midst of lions okay I'm surrounded by lions metaphorically he's saying I lie among ravenous beasts men whose teeth are spears and arrows whose tongues are sharp swords so this image of him in this cave with Saul's army circling We come to verse 5, the chorus. I'm going to skip over it. Verse 6, they spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. Selah. Then out of that pause, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing. I will make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Then again the chorus. So this is the beating heart of the song. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. and Let your glory be over all the earth. Verse 5 and verse 11. David says, I will worship. Saul won't stop me. 
uh, Philistines won't stop me. A cave won't stop me. My fears won't stop me. My doubts won't stop me. I'm going to sing through this cave. Even if it means I'm up all night, I'm going to awaken the new day with my song. When we look at the life of David as a whole, especially these cave psalms, we discover it was during this difficult period of life that God shaped and prepared David to be the king that he became. It was while hiding in a cave that David truly learned what it meant to trust God, what it truly meant to surrender himself. I believe the same is true for you and I thousands of years later. Uh, We've all had cave seasons, haven't we? Maybe you're in one today. They are dark moments, often lonely moments, heavy seasons filled with adversity, trial, testing. They can be times where we feel isolated, confused, discouraged. And if we're not careful, they can be seasons where we lose perspective. We lose our way. And so what I want to do is I, I, I look at the rest of the sermon is just spend some time thinking about what we can learn from David's cave experience to help us with our own. I'll, I'll throw these things out rather quickly. The first one is take refuge in his wings. We've looked at this, we pondered it many times over the years, but it's essential to keep coming back to. Uh, Rather than bottle up our feelings, our worries, our emotions, our questions, our doubts, which will explode into the relationships we're in if that's our plan. David repeatedly teaches us we can take it all to the God who made us for himself and who knows what's going on before we even say a word. Like David in verse 1, we can cry out to God, mercy, mercy, refuge, refuge. When things get hot, when pressure builds, we need to vent and God is always, always there for us to do so. As David says, he's the one who sends help from heaven. He's the one who rescues, he's the one who saves, so run to him. Tell him everything you're feeling. Tell him everything you're fearing. And do so knowing that he knows and that he cares. You know, even though this was such a difficult time in David's life, it's here that he learned that he could trust God with everything. And the picture he gives is of running to God like chicks would run to the mother hen to find refuge in the shadow of the wings. And it's a beautiful picture from nature. Birds will spread out their wings to shield their young from the sun. Uh, They'll shield their children underneath their wings when danger is about. They'll also bring their, 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 their chicks under their wings to provide warmth when it's cold. And it's a really cool picture that God gives us throughout the Bible to help us understand what he wants to do for us if we'll come and Take shelter in him. Here's the second one. Allow others into your cave. Uh, Too much of my life I've failed at this. I've tried to go through these things alone and only made things worse. But looking back on my cave experiences, those are moments where you learn who can really be counted on in your life, not just in the good times, but the bad times. The ones who will even enter into your suffering with you. That was true of David. In this season, he had so many people turn on him, yet even more risked their lives to be with him. Think of all that those 400 plus people left just to sit with David in a cave, uncertain how the story would end. My confidence and my experience is that if you're in a cave, God will send you help. God will send you people to support and come alongside you, but you've got to be vulnerable enough to let them in. And if it feels like no one's coming, then reach out. 
We even find Jesus doing this in his cave experience at the end of his life, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't enter it alone. The, the, the remaining group of the twelve, the eleven, were with him, and among them he invited three to join him even nearer. And if he needed people with him in the cave, how much more you and I? Here's a third thought, uh, kind of a weird one by title, Tend the Garden. It's a, a metaphor, planting and weeding. Sometimes the cave is a time where, as we're cut off and things slow down, we have a lot of time to do some important things. And so here I'm saying, think of your soul or your heart as a garden. You need to plant some things and you need to weed some things. And in the cave, you have great opportunity to do that, to do some soul care. And that's what David does. If you read through Psalm 57, he's planting some things. He's reminding himself he can have confidence in God. He reminds himself of God's mercy, of how God vindicates, of God rescuing and saving. He reminds himself that the love of God is so great it reaches to the heavens, so to speak. He reminds himself God is so faithful that if you were to measure it, it'd reach from sky to sky. He's planting those things in his soul, knowing that they give confidence and they grow into a great harvest. But even as planting, we should be doing some weeding. We should speak to our soul about things that have to be plucked up, thrown out. We've got to deal with things that are choking out the growth that God wants to do in us. Sin that entangles and holds us back. Doubts that need to be recognized and wrestled with. Fears that need to be surrendered to God. Worries that need to be torn out by the root. Tend the garden. Here's a fourth thing. Speak to your soul about the purposes of God. That's what David does in verse 2. After crying out for mercy and crying out for refuge, he speaks of God as the one who definitively will fulfill the purposes he has for David's life. Nothing's going to prevent it. In the cave, he's thinking about, God, what do you want to accomplish through this? He's putting his little life into the big picture of God's story. He's essentially praying what Jesus taught us all to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, how do you want to work in this situation? I think the cave, and this has been my reality, is an opportunity as we slow down to rediscover the purposes God has for our lives. Purposes we may have lost sight of. Even more, it reminds us we can trust God to fulfill those very things, even if it means we're in a cave for a bit. But I'd encourage you, refuse to let the cave be wasted. Surrender yourself to what God can teach you in the moments and how he can use even your circumstances in the cave on a much much larger scale, beyond your name, beyond your kingdom, beyond your comfort even. And trust him as David did that a day will come, you'll be able to look back on it, painful as it is, and say, God brought something out of that. God fulfilled something I didn't see at the time. God redeemed. While you're speaking to your soul, speak about faithfulness or steadfastness. Notice this is what David does. After talking about um, uh, the purposes of God, he essentially gives himself a pep talk. He says, my heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. Notice again, repetition. He's emphasizing this. He's talking that courage into himself, and we've got to do the same. We have to learn to say to ourselves, this isn't easy. It may not pass quickly. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but listen to me, soul. We're going to be steadfast. We're going to get through this in a way that honors God, and come hell or high water, we will be faithful. And you can speak to your soul about worship, too. 
and then do it. One of the most difficult but important things we do in a cave is worship, even in our waiting. You have to understand, David wrote this cave psalm and Psalm 34 and Psalm 142 are other cave psalms that I love. But he wrote them in the cave. And we find him there worshiping, even writing songs for us. And here, David's presumably been up through the night, as he probably has been many nights. Yet, we find him making this commitment to keep singing. He says to his soul, wake up, soul. Wake up, harp. Wake up, lyre. It's time to awaken a new day with the songs of the Lord. I love that defiance in the face of the trial. I will, he says, I will, I will. Saul won't stop me. Philistines won't stop me. Cave won't stop me. My fears won't stop me. The doubts of the people who are looking to me for leadership won't stop me. I'm going to sing. And I really love that not only does he tell his soul to wake up and sing, but he actually talks to his instruments, his inanimate objects. He says, wake up, harp, wake up, lyre. Maybe they'd been too quiet for too long. Maybe that's us as well. Maybe it's time for us to say, wake up, car stereo. Wake up, iPod. Wake up, CD player. I'm going to fire you up and we're going to start praising God again together. Even if I've been up all night, even if I'm in a cave, as the sun comes up, I'm going to welcome this day with songs of praise to the God who is exalted above all, even my trial. Here's the seventh thing, and I'm close to finishing. Seek God's glory above all. Even in the cave, notice David's song was not, God exalt me. Look how low I've been humbled. Lift me up so everyone sees who I am. Bring about my kingdom you promised me. Bring about the fame and the renown of my name and my plans for this kingdom. That's not what he's singing. What he's singing is be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory, the weightiness of who you are, spread through the nations like wildfire. It's the repeated chorus of this song. Verse 5 and verse 11. It's the heartbeat. Not just of this song, but the totality of David's life. How many times do we find him since he's setting aside his crown? To bow before the one who is king of kings and lord of lords. Are we doing that in our caves? Or as things have closed in on us, is it about our kingdom, our name, our exaltation, our plans, our purposes? So if we're not careful, what trial can do is make our cave echo with me, 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 me. The example we need to follow is David, but even beyond David, the ultimate example of Jesus is, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in his cave. What was his prayer? Take this cup from me, but not my will but yours be done. So I ask you, what is the song or what is the soundtrack of your life right now? What's echoing and reverberating in your cave? What lyrics do you awaken the dawn with? Here's the last one. Allow your cave experience to encourage others. Think about David's vulnerability and openness to share all of these songs with us. How many countless people through thousands of years have been blessed because David was willing to as he put it, to testify among the nations. 
that God is good and God is faithful and God rescues and God is refuge. And circling back to God's purposes, this is one of them. Even in the cave or coming out of the cave is that we would be able to testify to other people who need encouragement and comfort. The reminders that we ourselves have cherished and held to through our cave. May we bear witness, even in our trials, of the one who can and will fulfill his purposes for our lives. So I've been learning these things in my cave experiences, and I could share with you many, many other things, but I'm out of time, and I feel I've thrown enough at you already. But I hope that, like me, you'll grow to appreciate the richness and the beauty of these cave psalms. We may never uh, be anointed kings and queens living in the mountains of northern BC on the run for our lives. But deep in our souls, every one of us can relate to the pain of this psalm. And if we're wise, each and every one of us will learn from the wisdom of the psalm. My hope is that regardless of what each of our caves are, have been, will be, uh, that we will emerge from them transformed. And I, I know it's been a hard year. Uh, it's been a hard year for me too. This isn't what we want. It isn't what we've chosen. I trust we're getting to the end of it. Uh, but man, do I hope that we come out of this cocoon uh, far more butterfly than caterpillar. Far more like Christ than we went into it. And we can. We have no excuse not to. If we'll follow this example of David here. And so here's how I want to close. Usually I'd close in prayer. But instead I'm going to put this list up. Here's kind of eight lessons I've pulled out of this text and shared with you. And one comment I do want to make is that so often in our trials God brings us through these things help us in the cave, and then for some reason we think they belong left in the cage, or the cave, and we move on with our lives, we get busy, we enter a time of ease, and complacency sets in, and we stop doing these things. And so I want to say to you, don't quit, whether you're in a cave or you're not a cave, these are disciplines we have to carry every day of our lives. And as I close now, what I want to do is I'm going to leave these things up on the screen, I'm going to offer you maybe a minute or so or two minutes. If you want more, just hit pause in the video to see these things, reflect on these things, or just ignore these things and go to God in prayer and by the Holy Spirit and the things we've read in Psalm 57. Start pouring out your heart to Him. Take refuge in Him. Talk to Him about what you're facing. Lift up other people who you know are in a cave. My prayer that is regardless of what our circumstances may be right now, my hope is that all of us can sing with David, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all of the earth. Amen.
rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin the double kill save from wrath and make me my hands can fulfill thy law's demands these for sin could not atone thou must save and thou alone in my hand no price I bring simple to the cross I cling and his son they called him Jesus he came to love heal and forgive and die to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove my savior lives because he Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us this week. Uh, just a little bit of a youth announcement. Yes, we still are meeting. It's usually via Zoom, uh, but I do have a bit of an announcement, and I want to show you some pictures because this week we did a photo scavenger hunt, and we, I got a couple slides here just to kind of 
show you what's going on, what we had the kids out and doing. I do have another announcement, though, regarding our junior youth. We're going to be having a junior youth family photo scavenger hunt. And we want to encourage anyone who has a child who's in grade 5 through 7 to, to join in. I'll be posting all the information as long as the list of prizes and rules on our CHBC Junior Youth Facebook page and our uh, CHBC uh, adult page, I guess you could call it, <laughs> pages for everybody. So you'll see that on Monday, so, so tune in. But just on a, on a more serious note, if you watch the service today and, and you find yourself in a cave and, and you're feeling alone, I want to really invite you to reach out. I want you to, if, if, you, if you can't even just explain what's going on, Email somebody on staff here, just, I'm in a cave. We'll reply. We'll be praying for you. If you can, if, if you are, can get past that, I want to encourage you to reach out to Pastor Todd and, and get in this prayer group, guys. We're a family. We're designed to function and support and encourage and uphold each other. So know we're here. And if you need something, please, just, I'm in a cave. Uh, let's just close the service back in the heartbeat of it. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your, let your glory be over all the earth. Have a great week, everybody.